The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, has faulted the Supreme Court for setting free a former governor of Abia State, Senator Oji Uzokalu, from a 12-year jail. It described the judgment as unfortunate and a technical ambush. It, however, said it is ready for the retrial of Kalu as directed by the APES court. The EFCC made its reaction known in a statement by its head of media and publicity, Dele Oyewale. EFCC maintained the corruption charges against Kalu still subsist because of the Supreme Court did not acquit him of them. Meanwhile, the All Progressive Congress APC in Ebonyi has applauded Supreme Court for obtaining lower court judgment that sentenced Senator Oji Uzo Kalu to 12 years in prison on corruption allegation. Chief Eze Nwachuku, the state APC chairman of, on Saturday in Abakeleke, said the judgment delivered by the APS court was a victory for democracy and supremacy of the rule of law. He said that Ebony APC received the news with great joy and jubilation, adding that justice has been served following the acquittal. Nwachuku described the embattled Abia bond politician and businessman as one of the foremost Igbo leaders that devoted his entire life, career, and wealth to humanity. Joining us now via Skype is legal practitioner, Barrister Monde Ubani. Barrister Monde, thank you for joining us once again. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. How do you react to the ruling of the Supreme Court nullifying the convictions of Oji Uzokalu? Yeah, the judgment has received this reaction and reasons are, are many. Of course, of, if you study the, the history of the case, how long that case lasted, before finally the Federal High Court convicted and sentenced uh, OG, we would expect such reaction from certain uh, members of the public. But we need to explain uh, the legal uh, position of what actually transpired, why the Supreme Court had to do what they did. Uh, the, the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, Section 3, uh, 96, uh, subsection 7, actually gives room for a judge who has been handling a matter at the lower court and has been elevated to the higher bench to come uh, descend you know, uh, below in order to conclude the trial. And the reason why that particular insertion was made was because of uh, previous experience where judges who were handling matters and before conclusion were elevated, you know, couldn't continue with the trial and then the matter have to start in over. And in the process, you know, the witnesses will not be there. And before you know it, the, the case will be forgotten. So to ensure that we don't have a situation like that, this provision itself was made in order to actually capture this uh, particular uh, event. But unfortunately, there was not a corresponding provisional uh, amendment made to the Constitution in order to actually align this particular section with the Constitution. And so as long as that particular section is inconsistent with Section uh, 253, that gave Federal High Court jurisdiction, who defines who can competently sit in the Federal High Court. We must be a judge of the Federal High Court and not a judge that is higher, and not a judge that is below. And as long as it wasn't a judge of the Federal High Court that concluded that trial, the, the, the constitution was, uh, I mean, the law was, I mean, the judgment was said to be inconsistent. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the particular section was said to be inconsistent with the provisions of the constitution. And to that extent, it was uh, in, uh, null and void. And so the trial and the sentence was set aside by the Supreme Court. Oh, as a legal practitioner, now make us understand the justification for that ruling, bearing in mind and putting in view all of the elements and substance of that case. Well, the point is that that case was not decided on the merit. It was decided on the fact that the court that concluded the trial did not have jurisdiction. And jurisdiction is a, a threshold issue in law. If you have no jurisdiction as a court to try any matter, no matter how beautiful your judgment is, no matter how we conducted the trial, the entire process and proceeding will be uh, rendered a nullity, will be made a nullity. That has always been the law. It's because you can't put something on nothing. Issue of foundation is key. If a court has no jurisdiction to conclude a trial, to continue with a trial, that trial will be, you know, uh, will be uh, rendered a nullity. As serious as issue of jurisdiction is, it can be raised for the first time at the Supreme Court. For the first time, it can be raised even for the first time at the Supreme Court level. Even, you know, it can also be raised by the court, so much. Too. But the only thing that the court will give the lawyers the opportunity of addressing the court on the issue of jurisdiction. So jurisdiction is a very, very fundamental uh, principle in law. If a court has no jurisdiction to try any matter, whatever he has done, no matter how we conduct it, is clearly a nullity. So unfortunately, as I said earlier, there was an insertion of that section in the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. But there was not a corresponding amendment to the Constitution in order to make that law to be to align with the ground norm. And the ground norm of the, law, of the land is the Constitution. And any law that is made that is inconsistent with the Constitution will be declared null and void. It's unfortunate. 
what has happened. And of course, I can understand the frustrations of Nigeria, even EFCC. But the point is that the law was breached, and there was a clear violation of the Constitution. And the Supreme Court was clearly right in what they did by holding that particular section to be inconsistent, and then nullified the entire process. So EFCC should brace up and probably gather their witnesses once again and try to continue with the trial. And with a new judge, and I wish them good luck. Interesting, you made mention of the EFCC. Now, let's contemplate the EFCC statement describing the judgment as unfortunate and a technical ambush. Mm. That was clearly unnecessary. Uh, a judgment of the Supreme Court uh, cannot be said to be unfortunate. You know, even if they are trying to disagree with the judgment, or they will say, well, you have seen the Supreme Court and it's the final court, but whatever it is, they will try as much as possible to abide and then do what the Supreme Court has said in the circumstance. But describing the Supreme Court judgment as unfortunate and, 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 and technical and all that by an organization like EOCC is clearly uncalled for. It's unnecessary at this point. And I think it was a wrong use of language. I think that what they should do is that they should now go ahead and assemble their witnesses. There was a technical error that was actually made by both agreeing to expand the jurisdiction of the Federal High Court. And the court has held that parties cannot expand the jurisdiction of any court. It is actually the statute or constitution that gives jurisdiction to a court. And as long as that court has not been given by law, and parties now agree, the parties can never expand the, you know, the jurisdiction of a court. So there was an error made by both parties, both uh, by the defendant and by EFCC in agreeing for a judge of the Federal High, I mean, the uh, Court of Appeal to come down, to come and conclude the matter of the Federal High Court when he's no longer a judge of the Federal High Court. So a mistake was made, and it's a technical error which has affected the, the entire judgment. And so for me, they should uh, be a bit more this in circumspect and continue with the trial, let them assemble their witnesses and do what the Supreme Court has actually uh, uh, held. Assembling their witnesses and do as the Supreme Court asks ask them to do. Now, do you think in this retrial, is there a chance that you scale through? Of course, if uh, the, 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 uh, the evidence, I mean, the investigation has been very tight and they have all their, all their evidence intact and the witnesses are so willing to come back to give evidence. But what I advise, you know, they should scale down the number of charges instead of all these 20, 30 charges and all that. And then those areas where they have uh, uh, some level of uh, 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 good ground to secure conviction. They should concentrate on it and see what they can make out of it. It's an unfortunate incident, but there was an error. And I think by now the National Assembly may be bracing up to amend the Constitution to actually allow, uh, I mean, allow that particular section to align with the provision of the Constitution. So they should get down, get the witnesses they can, and then trim down the number of charges that they will now want to slam him with, and then make it a bit more compact, you know, and see what they can make out of, out of the entire thing. I'm not... And nobody is happy uh, you know, if there was any offense really committed for a man to go scot free. But sometimes things like this happen when there is a technical error that affects the foundation of every trial. And it happens this way. It's an unfortunate incident. And I'm not in any way uh, uh, envious of what has happened before the EFCC. But they should uh, brace up and see what they can make out of it. Barry Samonde Obani, thank you for joining us on the news and for your contribution. It's my pleasure, my brother.